to approve. Yes. And with that, we would like to, um, like we start all our sessions with the land acknowledgement. I would like to take this time to acknowledge and express our gratitude that uh, to the land that we are on today, which has sustained us and provided us the necessities of life. Uh, it has sustained not only us, but the generations that has preceded us and the generations that, that will come. I also recognize the blessing and opportunity to work with all of you on this important land. The land that Sheridan Edge is occupying is a traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, the Meti, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. But as we meet on this virtual platform, I would urge each one of you to acknowledge and reflect on whose land it is that you are occupying. Let us try to incorporate the principles of love, respect, and humility in our lives and reflect upon systemic oppression and colonial violence that has been and continues to cause so much hurt and suffering. Let us acknowledge our collective responsibility to honor those who have gone before us, those who are here, and those who are yet to come. Um, and with that, I'd uh, welcome you all to this session. It is a public session, so there might be a few of you who are joining us for the first time. So I'd like to welcome you on behalf of EDGE. EDGE is the impact, a social impact entrepreneurship um, hub of uh, Sheridan College. It is where impact and entrepreneurship thrive. It is a vibrant and inclusive community of people from all backgrounds and walks of life who believe that entrepreneurship can make a lasting change in society. We support change makers as they explore their entrepreneurial approaches to create a more equitable and sustainable world. Um, at Edge, we have a lot of supports that are available for our members and entrepreneurs. We help founders grow ideas and ventures that support a triple bottom line approach of planet, profit, and people, offering mentorship, learning programs, and inclusive community, a co-working space, and funding. Edge connects Sheridan students to opportunities to learn and work with startups and collaborate with community partners to support impact entrepreneurs in the region. Um, I'd like to hand it over to Marisol, who will take you through the rest of the slides. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sanjana. My name is Marisol. I am the manager of Impact Learning at Edge. Uh, it's great to see you all here, and thank you for joining us. And well, in this slide, we can see um, a few pictures of the amazing space we have in Edge. If you've been looking for affordable and centrally located co-working space in the heart of Mississauga, we have co-working memberships starting as low as $100 a month, and it includes hot desk access, access to kitchenette with all day coffee or tea, meeting room time and discounts, business mailing address, and a lot more. We also have day passes available, and all our plans are all, all of our plans are month to month and flexible for you and your teams. Um, if you're here about this first, we are launching officially in the next couple of months. So please visit our webpage to learn more or reach out to us for more information or to book a tour. Uh, also, if you have Sheridan students in the house today, uh, you get a free membership to Edge to access learning modules on entrepreneurship and change making and access to staff advisors and peer community as well. So please visit the link that we're going to put in the chat um, right now and let us know, reach out to us. Uh, the next slide, please, Sanjana. Just a quick reminder about our upcoming public, public sessions. Uh, we have finance and funding for startups on Tuesday, February 14th. It's Valentine's, so it's perfect day for talking about finance and funding. <laughs> Uh, we have an amazing workshop with Lorena Garvey on Indigenous Principles for Startups. Please join us for that one. It's amazing. I highly recommend, well, all of our workshops are great, but this one particularly for me is very close to my heart. And we have also alternative business models. Also, uh, an amazing one is it's public and it's in person. So you will see your space if you come to that one in February. And now, uh, the next one, please, Indiana, it's time for the piece of today. <laughs> Christelle here is a person who I deeply admire, works with the Rice Ventures at Edge to help them accelerate growth. She has a huge heart for startup founders and entrepreneurs, 
born through her experience in owning and growing several small businesses and developing high profile community organizations. She's a seasoned advisor in the startup and accelerator space, a master networking. Uh, she connects the dots to the people, programs, and events that help her clients at Edge grow. With her natural ability to easily establish confidence and build trust, resolve conflicts, and motivate people to move forward, she has helped rise social enterprises and impact ventures and purpose-driven businesses in the Edge community grow revenue and impact, while at the same time strengthening the longevity of the venture. Crystal Mains is the right coach to move rice funders past their fear and take the right next steps to accelerate growth. With her knowledge in financial management, including forecasting and budget management, she supports rice ventures and many ventures across the, across the province um, in revenue gains through funding and financing initiatives, as well as pure focused business development and sales activities. Thank you so much, Crystal, for being here. Um, it's really an honor to hear you speaking tonight. Oh, thank you so much. I feel like I should, I don't know what to say after all of that. <laughs> that was really loading this up for us. So thank you again, Marisol. Thank you, Sanjo. I'm very happy and very honored to be here tonight. Um, welcome, folks. It's, it's um, uh, my role at EDGE is such a, a dear, dear project to me. I enjoy working with entrepreneurs. I'm also an executive director of a small business center. So in my, my other job and my other hat, I wear, um, I love working with small businesses, but when I come to EDGE, uh, we've got some great businesses that I've been helping to coach over the last couple of years. I love the excitement. I love the enthusiasm. And I'm so happy to be here tonight. And that co-working space looks great. So I'm gonna talk to you about that myself. Maybe I need to pop into Sheridan. I'm in Guelph right now, but that would be a nice place to, to show up every once in a while. So. With that in mind, I'm going to get started with market research and market research. People are like, ah, oh, it could be such a boring topic. Market research, really? And I got to tell you, I, I used to feel that way. I really did until I ran my businesses and found myself constantly looking for information. I was, I've been the proud owner of four different businesses. I'm currently on my fifth business and that's around project management and stuff. But I always found myself searching for information, searching for answers, and started to realize how market research at every stage of your journey in entrepreneurship is equally important. So we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Uh, my style is very free flow. I'm happy. I'm just going to present some information. I've got a lot of tools here for you to use. I promise you Sanjana is going to send the resources. She's going to put them in the chat um, as we talk about them. So. Uh, you know, and I'll talk about where these resources are and happy to answer any questions that you may have. So I will, let's get started. I'm just going to share my screen if I can do that. We practice, so it should show up. Let's see. I hope everybody can see that. Good stuff. Thanks, Marcel. Okay, so we'll get started. And as I said, if I don't see you popping up in the chat, I will be flagged and I'm happy to answer questions. So we're talking about market research tonight. I promise I'll try to not make it boring for you. This is the driest part of the whole presentation. Okay, I always have to start with the actual official definitions. And market research is that collection analysis. You're all very smart people. You can all read this. But what I'm saying to you is that, you know, I need you to keep in mind as you're, some of you are in the startup stage. Some of you are just starting to launch and build. Some of you are already scaling your businesses regardless of where you are, it's going to be very important to know information about the marketplace that you're working in. It's going to be, and that ever-changing marketplace, right? Look what COVID did to our world. Talk about changing the landscape on, on running businesses. Holy smokes, you know, but it happens, right? And so, you know, you're going to have to be educated on customers. Customers' tastes change, People's opinions and thoughts and what they're looking for changes, right? And so the only way you're going to do that is to continue to do your market research. And I'm going to show you some ways today that will help you sort of keep on top of this so you keep that moving forward. So, you know, why do we do market research? Well, just as I said, there's a couple sort of key areas that you need to think about. And again, as I'm speaking to you, either as a startup or as an existing business is looking to scale. The first place you want to start with, and I always sort of work with, is the target market. Here's my first balloon breaker I'm going to talk to you about tonight, is that not everybody's your customer. I'm sorry, I hate to say that, but it's the truth and it's the fact. And, you know, I love working with small businesses. They'll come to me and say, 
you know, but everybody's going to love my product. Everybody's going to want my product. Everybody's going to buy it. Not true at all. So one of the main things that you need to do in every stage of your business, including startup, is really get clear on who your target market is. And there will be demographics that will start to surface once we do some research. And we're going to talk about ways of doing research and things like that. But it's really important for you to understand who your target market is. You can have more than one target market. You might have one or two. Once you pass three, it gets too convoluted and you start to become unfocused in your business. So I promise you we'll come back to that. But who is your customer is going to be one of your main topics. The other part is around the competition. It is incredibly important for you to understand who is your competition, who is in the space that you're working at. And the reason that's important is because we're dealing with very educated customers these days. People do their homework. Let's be honest. Each and every one of us are a consumer, correct? We all buy things. We all you know, go out into the marketplace. And a lot of us are pre, you know, doing our homework before. I just went through the process of buying a car. And I had, so I was online trying to figure out what dealerships I wanted to deal with, what type of car was I looking at. I was doing my research, looking at options, comparing numbers, comparing all kinds of benefits, features of the cars, so that when I walked into the showrooms, then I had, I had a lot of education and information that I was able to bring with me so that I end up being educated and understand that I was getting a good deal. This is our customers, this is the place. And I don't care if you're working with uh, selling from business to, to client or business to business. Competition is a big thing. And I'm gonna show you a way and a tool of getting clear on who is your competition in this space. Some of you will argue, I don't have competition, Christelle. I'm very niche and I'm very different. I argue you still do. Let me come back to that when we talk about it. The other third place is the actual marketplace itself. What are you offering? And you might be surprised at the answer of that because you know you may be offering a product or a service, but there's more that goes to it. You start to think about you know what marketplace am I? Are you going to be an online with your sales? Are you going to be you know B two B? Are you going to go directly to the customers? Are you going to drop ship and work through you know uh, shipping companies and things like that? You got to start to think. Are you going to have a brick and mortar place of business where people can come to? You know, and then with that same context, who is in that same space with you? How are they conducting business so that you understand when you insert yourself in that marketplace, you have a very clear view of who else is in that marketplace at that point too. That becomes important because then you want to make sure that you develop what's niche, what's special about you so that it, it will help inform your marketing activities later, right? Unless you know this information, folks, you don't have a business. I said it. I absolutely said it. You got to be clear on this stuff. And at every stage of business, it's going to ebb and flow and change. And that's where you have to ebb and flow and change with it. Okay. Really important. I'm just checking my, I see a couple of things in the chat, but I just want to make sure it was nothing for me. So we're good to go. Okay. So, you know, just as you are building your ideas, you know, if you have an idea and something you want. So whether I'm starting a new business and I'm started planning my business, Maybe I'm an existing business and I'm thinking about increasing, uh, bringing on another product to my service or my product offering, or I'm bringing on another type of service to my service offering. You know, there's the stuff that we have these ideas, we have these great ideas, and then there's the stuff that we know already. We might know that, you know, maybe we've worked in the industry, maybe we've been educated in this industry. We might understand that there's a need for this idea. That idea came from somewhere, it came from an experience, it came from uh, you know, somewhere was planted and we started to build on that. So there's the stuff that we know already, but then there's the stuff that we need to know, if you will. And that's why market research and market, you know, becomes so important. Looking at competitive analysis, actually doing the research in the field, because it will inform your marketing plan. Why do I say that? Well, because the activities that you choose to market and market your product or service will need to be informed by the target market that you're looking to, to infiltrate. If you don't have that correct information, you might as well take all that cash you have in your hand and throw it out the window. 
because your the idea that it's just hopefully it'll you know somebody will grab it and find it doesn't exist. And most of us start out with very I'm going to say lim I don't want to say limited like negative, but we have a target budget that we're working with with our marketing dollars. So by doing our market research ahead of time and really understanding, getting clear who the target market is, so we can pick activities that will be most relevant to that particular target market, is going to give me a better shot at actually reaching, reaching the marketplace that I want to sell to. Make sense? This is the way it flows and this is how we plan and go through it, okay? And you can see this, this is a normal planning process. I'll come back to that at the end. So there's two types of market research. There's what we call primary research and secondary research. Primary, so I'm gonna start with primary. Primary research, and the reason why these are so important is two things. Primary research is actually going to the source. It is going to your potential customer, to the company that you wanna to sell to, to the particular person that you want to sell to, to the industry marketplace that you wanna to sell to and actually garnering information from that so that you can use that in, again, to feed your activities. I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. I wanna talk about secondary market research. I heard we just at the beginning here, some Lauren was sharing a story about just writing and we were talking about, I heard a little bit of grants and things like that. Anybody looking at uh, any type of funding from business, um, from, uh, sorry, my brain just went like this. My brain goes a little too fast in my mouth sometimes. Banks, if you're looking at any kind of investment opportunities, maybe you're looking for somebody to invest in your business, or you're looking at going to a bank or credit union for a loan or capital, anything like that, you're going to need a business plan. You're going to need an actual tangible business plan. You will not get anywhere without that, I can guarantee you. They have a lot of stuff online these days, so those agencies can help you, as do Edge has some, and I'll share a tool at the end that you can also utilize as well for those types of things, for business plans. But why I say that is when you, and in order to take this forward, you when you build a business plan, you're building a business case as to why this particular investor or why this bank or credit union would give you the money, right? You have to build a business case. Part of that business case Include showing that you've done the research, that this is not just some random idea that you thought, oh, this is a great idea. You know, please give me the money and let's just, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, again, throwing the money out the window, right? It's not what we want to do. So you want to make sure that there's secondary research attached to any type of research that you're doing. We're building a business case and I'll show you some examples of that. Oh, sorry. I'm going to flip this and I'll come back. I promise. So Google, has anybody heard of Google Trends? Google Trends, cool place. If you haven't, check it out. It is a free resource from Google that talks and helps you inform you on industry, whatever industries you're looking at. And I have to be very generic tonight because I've got all types of businesses here. Trends in that industry. It's a fascinating tool. It's an excellent tool and it will give you a lot of information. Secondary research means building that case study, as I mentioned. So you might be looking for reports, statistical information. Stats can is a great thing. Anybody here in the room filled out a census about a year or two ago? I guess that was in 2020, I think it was, that we did the last census. I know that's when we did it in Guelph. Anytime you fill out a census, guess what? That's where that information goes to. It's housed by Statistic Canada. And any one of us have the right to access that information once they publish it. So, you know, things like if you're looking at building a business in a particular city, for example, you might be looking on the stats of the size of city, the breakdown of those stats. It might tell you, you know, how many families are there, how many apartments, how many residential, things like that. Again, depending on your type of business, those, those types of uh, numbers and information are important to you because you might be trying to look at the market size and to see if it's right for you or not. There's all kinds of information stats can. The uh, Fed Dev Ontario, you'll notice they have a small business on Ontario. Um, this is an excellent resource. Guess what? You actually get to talk to a real live person. I said it out loud. Government agency, I'm sorry, I'm not anti-government by any means, but sometimes it's a little frustrating when you can't actually talk to a person. You can with FedDev Ontario. It's amazing. And what you do is you connect with them. They, you'll 
will talk about. And if you're looking for, again, a particular industry you need some more information about, maybe you're looking at healthcare and trying to get an idea of the particular marketplace in healthcare that you're looking for. What's the size of the market? What's the demographics around it? Things like that. You can contact BedDub Ontario and let them know what you're looking for. They will return the information to you within a 48 hour period. For real, great resource, excellent resource, and it helps you get the information that you need. Once you take, get, start to get this public library. I love the public library. You know, we're so used to doing everything online and I get it, it's convenient, things like that as well. But, you know, going back to the library, if there's something specific, maybe you're trying to track down suppliers, maybe you're trying to track down, uh, you know, different wholesalers or manufacturers or things like that. If you're not finding that information readily available online, go and visit your public library, go and see them, go and talk to them. They have so many data sources that they can access for you that they might get that information quicker to you and easier to you and they're happy to help, right? That's the, that's the beautiful part of our public libraries. The one on the bottom corner there, if you'll notice, is called BizPal. And I'm gonna ask to put this in the chat. It's B as in Bob, I-Z-P-A-L dot C-A. This is a municipal data tool. And what it does is you go on BizPal, it'll ask you, uh, you, the front screen will ask you about three to four questions about the type of business that you're looking to open or you have opened, okay? It'll ask you just a couple data points. Then what it will do is on each area that you live, so if I lived in Burlington, I would put in Burlington, or if I lived in Oakville or Mississauga, I would put that in my heading. And then once you complete those questions, it will then direct you to this, the resources that you need to source for that particular city. So for example, if I was opening a hair hairdressing salon, you know, I wanted to open up a hair salon, I would put in Burlington, I would put in hairdressing salon, and then I'd answer a couple of the questions. It would then lead me to the appropriate departments where perhaps I need a business license, for example. So in order to operate that business in Burlington, I'm gonna need a business license. It will provide me with the business license contact information for Burlington. Right. It'll also tell me if there's other things that I would be that would be applicable to the type of business that I'm operating. Even if you're an existing businesses, this can help you. This is a great tool. It's free. And another example is I've seen where I had a contractor who was a client of mine. And he goes and does obviously as a contractor, he's building decks and things like that uh, and fencing. He specialized in decks and fencing, things like that. He would use BizPal as a tool for the cities that he was going to do work in. So for example, if he got a job living in Guelph, but he got a job in Oakville, he would use BizPal to look up Oakville, to look up permitting that would be necessary in order to put decks and fencing in. And then he would have all the contact information there. Again, free resource, great tool, get the information. Secondary information is important to help build credibility around your subject matter, around the business case of you developing and building this business. And anybody who is interested in investing your business in their, your business, whether it's a bank or, a real, or an investor, or so I keep wanting to say real estate, I don't know why, but a venture capitalist perhaps, they will want to know that you did the research. They will want to see that the articles that you, that you have put into the research around, you know, just the statistical data and all the number crunching and things like that. They want to see that. They're not going to give you any money without that type of information. Okay, so really important. Hope that helps. Questions around sometimes, you know, the demographics. I remember to, I mentioned about demographics. Depending on the nature of your business, this is sometimes how specific you may need to get. I say me, me, because not all these would appeal to you or be relevant to your business model. But if, for example, I was, I was building a business that was, um, maybe I was specializing, I was going to open a children's hair salon, you know, and, and specific to children ages, let's say two to, two to 10, let's say. Remember they used to call them, I don't know if they still have them now, they were called melon heads at one time. Have you ever saw them? But they were a child salon that was very child friendly when you walked in. Primary colors, TV screens with cartoons going and those chairs that they sat in were actually rides. Anyway, I digress because that was a good memory. If I was looking at a specific demographic, age would definitely be an important one there. Maybe not so much gender or race, you know, but number of children in a family would be important. 
uh, living status would be important, annual income. The reason being is because of course, even though that type of business would be specific, my target market would be, you would think would be children, it's actually the parents of those children, right? Because the children aren't driving themselves to the salon. So, you know, you have to think about that. So those types of demographics would be important because based on the research that I did about the demographics that fit with children and families of that age range, then I would take, I would craft my marketing tools and tricks to attract that same marketplace, okay? And rather than waste time and money, okay? Marketing to somebody 50 plus, unless they have grandchildren, really wouldn't make sense to them because chances are it's going to the parents that's gonna take them to that salon. You see where I'm going. Once you start to gather your demographics, you start to look at what, and this is what we call the user persona. And hopefully some of you have seen this before. If you haven't, this tool will be put in the chat for you. It's an actual, I wanna, sorry, before I start talking about tools, I'm gonna to be showing a couple of tools in the next little couple of screens here that are actual tools that you can download. So there'll, you'll notice that there's a link um, to this tools called Sprint Point. These company, I will just want to explain where this company comes from. Uh, as a business center, I worked with this company called 2H Media uh, and helped them build their business. They've been very successful. And so they started volunteering their time back at the center to help other entrepreneurs be successful. They kept hearing the resources that we needed and we kept saying, you know, we would keep sending, trying to find resources and, and make, you know, play with resources so that they made sense to our clients and things like that. So what they actually did is they built a second company called Sprint Point. Sprint Point is a, a, a depository, if you will, of all kinds of business resources that is free to anybody to use. So I will just preface this by saying, you are more than welcome to download this. You will be asked for your email. I promise you, I promise you, you will not be solicited in any way. It's just the way they had to do it in order to do the work, the mechanism of you receiving the free product, okay? But please take a look at this. There's other great resources on here. I'm gonna share some of them tonight, but please take it. And again, this is just something that's free to you and there's no any type of solicitation or bother you afterwards, I promise, okay? Uh, hi, Nathaniel. Hi, could you say the name of that program again? Sure, it's, 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 it's called sprintpoint.ca. Spreadpoint.ca. thank yeah, you. Yeah, and you and actually, Sajana is gonna put the links for each of the tools in here, so that'll help lead you as well. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for asking. So user persona or buyer persona as they're referred to are really important um, because as I mentioned, when you start to really figure out who your target market is, this is a great tool to actually almost build an avatar, if you will, right? Because the better you can understand your target market, your clients, the better then you can utilize that information to be more strategic in your running the business, marketing, sales, et cetera, right? It's, it's, just, it's just a fact. So we, it's easy for us to get sort of uh, <laughs> waylaid sometimes with all stuff. So this keeps us focused on track. And so what you use this tool is you can actually start to build, like I said, a persona. You can put a picture in, you can use clip art, if you will, free clip art. I was, I never paid, I don't like to pay for things. So free clip art to put in a picture of what your demographic would look like, what they would look like, what their goals. Surely, as I said, the fact that you started this business leads me to believe and understand that you knew something about the target market to start with. And that's where you start with here. You know, you've already, there's already a point of relation that you understand whether you're your target market, whether it's somebody that you know is your target market, but build your avatar based on what you know. And, and you, can, you can get pretty specific about this. As I said, you can start to, and do some research again, if there's, there's uh, perhaps if Gen X, if you will, is your target market, then, and you're not quite sure about Gen X, maybe your parents are Gen X or a friend of the family is Gen X, but you're not quite sure, you can start with that and then do some research on Gen X to help fill out the rest of the information. As I mentioned very uh, early in the slides, Target markets, you don't want to get more than three target markets. Reason being is you start to get very convoluted and you're not focused in your intent because, again, you're just standing at the window, throwing out dollar bills and saying, well, I hope somebody catches it. That's not what we want. 
you're not tied to this, you will find that your personas will change, just like our world changes every day. But you know, it gives you a base point to start. And if you haven't done this, I strongly suggest even as a company that's already launched, make sure you do this, make sure you put this practice in because I will and, and check back to see that you know the activities that you've chosen to market to your type of persona are matching because if you're not getting results and you're not getting sales then there's a disconnect highly recommend you go back to this right i'll give you an example i am part of the gen x crowd i i am 50 plus and very proud of that um, and so for me if you were building a persona around me uh, you would very be very specific in things like you know types of marketing tools I can tell you, everybody familiar with Facebook, right? Everybody's familiar with Instagram. Of those two, one is more popular with the Gen X crowd and one is not, okay? So traditionally, and again, I'm saying traditionally, there are more Gen X members on Facebook than they're on Instagram. Doesn't mean that there's not anybody on Instagram. I also have an Instagram account. However, predominantly, I use Facebook more, and that is that demographic. There's an age demographic. They think they have it around 40 plus um, tend to use Facebook more. So it doesn't mean a 20-something doesn't have a Facebook persona, but chances are they're using other platforms rather than Facebook. So if I'm marketing to that Gen X crowd, I might be thinking that Facebook might be a better platform for me to start with as a marketing tool versus Instagram, versus Snapchat, versus TikTok. You see where I'm going with that? And just being focused in on that, I'm going to have a better chance at sort of starting to generate what that looks like and see a, hopefully a quicker return on my investment of whatever marketing activity I chose. Any questions about that? I wanna keep going because I could talk about this for hours, um, but if there's something burning, otherwise we'll go. So this is an important tool. And as I said, if you have a couple of clients, you know, you might have um, uh, an example of that, you know, would be somebody who is, let's say a personal trainer. I might have a personal training business. My main focus in my business is personal training. That's what I do. So clients, I pay me by the hour to help them with their personal training and, and weightlifting and things like that. I might also have um, an excuse the term side hustle, but I might also sell maybe protein shakes and vitamins and things like that. Maybe I carry a line of products as well. It's complementary to my personal training business. It's the second source of revenue. And I might have a different client who just wants to come to me for those vitamins and protein shakes, things like that. They may cross connect, they may not. I might also have a client that does, have you ever heard a lot of personal trainers will do, um, who are specialized in nutrition and that, will do uh, cooking classes, right? Cooking classes, they'll shop, you know, they'll teach you how to shop in a store. Incidentally, you're supposed to stay to the four walls on the outside of the store. All the stuff in the middle is not good for you. Just gonna point that out. However, so what they'll do is these, they will do cooking classes. Well, they'll show you how to cook and eat healthy. Again, that's a particular demographic that might be interested in that, not everybody. So if I was doing my personas, I would do one for my supplement business, one for my personal training, and one for those cooking classes and things like that. And my marketing activities, some of them might overlap because there might be you know, connections, but some of them might be uniquely different. And that's okay. And that's the example of where if I do more than that, then I'm becoming sort of convoluted and I've lost my, my focus. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. I like to use some examples just some just to clarify it. The other important I'm tool sorry. here. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. There was just a question in the chat regarding one of the previous slides. Yeah. Where it was the question is, what are you offering for that? You had said you might be surprised. So you wanted to wanted you to elaborate on what you mean by surprise. Mm. I can't, I don't remember where that was. Was that, oh, when it was talking about whether you have direct comp, um, target market or not competition, was that what it was? Yeah, the yeah, first slide. I'm, I'm gonna come back to that. Let me come back to that one second. I'll be there in a minute, I promise. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, so the other tool that you wanna see as also is what we call a customer journey map. 
So one of the other things when you start to play out with your target market, this actually is, believe it or not, it is part of your market research um, and it leads to your target market, um, target market and journeying their journey and figuring out again, marketing activities that support along the way as well too. So a couple of things you wanna think about, you know, oops, I'm sorry, oh, I'm jumping screens here. So what happens is what you need to think about is as you're planning your activities, you want to think about what the point of a customer becoming aware of your business, how do they do that? So if I decide today to open up a brand new business, I register my business and I'm open for business, how do I let people know I exist in business? A lot easier if I had a bricks and mortar per se, or had a, you know, a, a, an office where people could come to or whatever. But if I'm, if I'm an online business, an e-commerce business, a lot hard to find me. So figuring out, start to think about where your marketing activities and you, and you start researching, how do you get people to be aware of your business? First of all, then we go off through the stages of engagement. How do we get them to connect with us? And we call those touch points, right? It takes, just so you know, a little side fact here, it takes at least a minimum of three touch points with a client before they start to take you seriously. True story. So if you're selling business to business, there's going to be different ways of connecting with them. You know, maybe it's you meet at a networking function, you follow up with an email, you follow up with a phone call to book a, an in-person meeting, something like that. Three touch points before people start to take you seriously. So you have to start thinking about, you know, what are, what, what are these touch points? What are these ways of connecting and making sure that they're in line with your target market? Then we want to move them from getting in touch with us and understanding what we do and sort of courting them, if you will, to actually making the buying decision. And what happens at that point? What are the activities that would support them buying, purchasing from us? And there's, again, we could spend lots of time on this, but you know, there's lots of different businesses in the room, but thinking about how does that happen? What's the transition and transaction on that? And then the last piece is the follow-up. And in my opinion, that's the most important part of any customer journey is the follow-up, the post work, because there's a rule in business. Uh, a lot of people hope you have heard of it. If you haven't heard of it, it's called the 80-20 rule. And I tell you right now, 80% of your business will come from only 20% of your clients. I'll say that again. 80% of all the business you do will only come from 20% of your clients. Those are your loyals. Those are the people who really love working with you. Those are the ones who keep returning. Those are the, that's, that, that's your, if you get your target market right and you get your persona right, that's your buyer persona right there. So we want to make sure that that 20% keeps coming back to see us, right? We need them to keep returning in order to keep doing business. So I'll show you this just sort of filled out to give you a bit of an idea so we know what we're doing. And again, uh, we can, I think they'll share these slides as well. So you can take a look at this later. So for an example, this is a company that had basically, um, they were selling a service, um, an app and things like that. So they actually, if you notice, they actually, in this case, they use television. It's a bit extreme, but anyway, they had the money to do a, a television commercial where they did an advertisement in order to create awareness about their particular type of, of um, it was accounting software that they were trying to sell, okay? So they did, a, they did an advertisement on TV with a call to action. So you'll notice just below the, um, Sorry, this is in my way here. Just below where it says the research piece. So in order for them to, for clients to do the research, they gave them some options. They told them to basically go to the website and check out for more information. They asked, you had a customer service department where they could arrange to talk to somebody and speak to somebody. Um, sorry, why my eyes have gone really blurry here all of a sudden. Um, and I can't see that last thing. Sorry, I apologize. That's really bizarre. Um, just going to change my glasses here for a second. Excuse me. Okay. I apologize. I just went. There we go. It's a little better. Um, I still can't see the bottom slide, so I apologize. The bottom one there. Um, my point being that there was different touch slides. There was an online visit. 
there was an email visit, and there was, I think that's a kiosk there. So, you know, there was different ways for customers to get the research that they needed, because just as you're doing research, your customer's doing research too, which then led to the purchase, right? And at that stage, this is where the purchase was, what marketing you know, activities would need to happen. This is part of your research process, right? Because you start, you think about it now. You don't think about when it happens. You got to start thinking about this now. What's the planning process for this, right? Then what happens with the delivery? In this particular item, they could download it or they can, and then they actually receive this confirmation where they could then follow up for after sales report, support, right? To make sure, and you can see the trajectory here. So with your particular, when you're doing your market research, part of this is actually going to walk through your customer's journey. You're gonna walk through their, with their steps from the point of awareness to the point of how can we make it easy for them to research us and get the information that they need so that they will make the purchase that we want them to make from us so that we can get the product and service delivered to them as they, they wanted and requested, that we can support them if there's any problems or any energy, and that they will give us a wonderful review, they'll give us a five-star in Google ratings, whatever, tell all their friends and refer us back and then create the cycle again. This is part of an essential part of your research. And you would be amazed at how many businesses, even who have already launched, haven't walked through this process yet. It's critical. It's critical because, again, each step of the way will inform on how your business is going to run and how it's going to show up in the marketplace. So you need to give the time and attention to that for sure. I'm going to keep moving. And I promise I'm coming to your question about the surprise part. The surprise part. Woo! Look at that, right? Uh, SWOT analysis. If anybody's ever, we're talking about monitoring the competition. So when we talked about the competition, we, we, walk, we talk about a SWOT analysis. Those of you who haven't seen this acronym before, it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And so what this is, is remember, if you remember way back in our first one of our first slides, one of the little bubbles was around competition. It is incredibly important for you to make sure that you understand who the competition is. Their service might vary a little bit, product might vary a little bit, but if they're in the same marketplace as you pretty similarly, then you have to understand them because trust me, your clients are understanding them as well, okay? So it's really important. So this is a tool that you can use that you literally can visit, you can go and see competitors, you can go and you can talk to them if you don't feel comfortable about that. Some people are like, oh, I don't wanna, especially you live in a smaller community, um, you know, you wanna, it's important you know, get friends and family, this is where they can help out with things like this. But the idea being is you're going to look at your client and you're going to, or excuse me, not your client, your competitor, and you're going to rate them. And now this is not, we're not looking to bash them down and make ourselves better than them. That's not the point. This is a learning exercise. I'm gonna flip forward one knot because there's an actual form that you, oh, you can't see it very well, darn it. I'm gonna to have to make these bigger. So what this is, is first of all, so what you would do is you would look at what does the company do well, so, right? So you would use this form and you can fill it out or you can fill it online, whatever. What do they do well? So if somebody's been in business for 30 years, I would say that's an incredible strength. It's an incredible, wonderful thing about them. Maybe they have great customer service. Maybe they have a great showroom. Maybe they have free delivery. Maybe they do an excellent, have an excellent website. Maybe they have amazing social media. Whatever it is, we're not looking to copy them, but we're looking to sort of see what is it they do well because there's a reason why they're in business and still in business, especially as we go through difficult economic times, the fact that they're still standing is something to be learned, right? What are they doing really well? At the same time, we're looking at what they're not doing well. So maybe they are, you know, adversely, maybe they have a terrible website. Maybe they don't have an online store. Maybe they don't have, they have terrible social media or they don't even use social media. Maybe they charge overcharge for services. Whatever that is, you need to look at it from a lens again of not beating down the competition, but understanding what you know potentially is somebody else's company's other weakness is your opportunities. And that's the key place. 
if there's if my one of my competitors or a couple of my competitors are in the marketplace and I'm looking at them and they're not offering something that I can now offer with my business and it's it's part of my business plan and opportunity that I was looking at, then that helps me start to differentiate myself in the marketplace. If I was looking at building a furniture store, let's just say, and I was going into um, you know, a, a marketplace that there was already four other furniture stores, I would wanna spend time and make sure I understand what each furniture store was about, what's their product line, what's their pricing like, what type of market are they catering to? And I would choose to bring in furniture that was not the same, was different, was unique in its proposition so that it helps elevate me as a niche type of market, a niche furniture store and gives me a place in the marketplace, right? If I'm exactly the same as the competition, then there is no business because now what you're doing is just dividing dollars, right? You're just, instead of going to four stores, there's five stores to now divide up the same dollars. So you wanna start thinking about that. The other thing you wanna think about is what we call, there's a difference between direct competition and indirect competition. So direct competition, an example of that was if I was to build a, if I was going to open up a stationary store where you sold office equipment and I did photocopying services and I had all kinds of stationary products and you name it. Sound familiar? Maybe a Staples, I'm sure a lot of us have been in Staples, would be my direct competition, right? They sell very similar products, services, things like that. They would be considered what I call direct competition. However, there's also an indirect competition. And if you, last time you've ever been in a Costco, last time you've ever been in a Walmart, think about that. There often are supplies there. There's stationary supplies in Costco for sure. They always have like a desk set out, chairs. They have office chairs they sell. They sell the coffee in bulk. They sell pads of paper and boxes, very similar. Costco, Walmart, they're all the same. That is not their main source of business. That's not why they're in business, but they are indirectly a competition because there will be people that will buy their stationary products at Walmart or Costco or buy that office chair at Costco, et cetera. So they are something to keep in mind. When I talked about people, and that was the surprise part about the competition, if you don't think you have competition, here's the thing. For those of you who do truly have a unique niche, I'm gonna call it a unicorn type of product or service, that's fair. What you're competing for though really is the customer's dollars. So a lot of every, every one of us, we have money coming into our households, money going out of our households. At the end of the day, we have what we call disposable income. Unless your product is a need to have to exist type of product, you are competing with my disposable dollars at the end of the day. That's the surprise part, right? I only have so much discretionary income that I can spend. And so you trying to tempt me, if you will, with your product or service is something I especially don't need to survive is your competition, right? Because I might choose to spend that money somewhere else on some other item. So that's where the surprise part is, everybody has competition, whether it's indirect, direct, or you're competing against disposable dollars. I hope that was a good enough surprise. I was like, oh, okay. As opposed to, oh, lunch bag let down, as they used to say, hope not. But that's just to explain that. So the SWOT analysis, there is a template through uh, Sprint Point. And so this is exactly what you do. Once you have this information, it then arms you to understand where you stand in the marketplace. And when a customer comes to you saying, I've been to ABC store down the street and, you know, I can do this, this and this. We don't want to use this information to grade or put down. You never, ever say a bad word about another business ever. Rule number one in business, never, because you know that'll somehow get back to people. You never do that. But what you do do is armed with that information, you say, great, ABC is doing that. Great. Here's what we're doing here. And because you know about ABC and you know what works and what doesn't work with them, you can tailor your sales based on what you do know that is exceptional about your particular business. Does that make sense? That's, but unless you did the research, 
you wouldn't be able to answer those questions. You wouldn't be able to help sell yourself above the competition. You wouldn't be able to do that at all. And that's where it's critical for your success. Okay, really, really critical. I'm just mindful of time here because I know where we're at here. Oh, time flies when we're having fun. Okay, so I'm gonna keep moving here. So that's what why you want to be niche and understand what your is. You want to know where your competitive advantage is, where you are in that marketplace, understanding where the competition is, understanding what's different or special about you that makes you niche. Even if it is you give better customer service, or maybe it is you just have free delivery and you think that's not a big deal, you're going to utilize that in your marketing tactics because it is a big deal. And it will help stand you stand out in the marketplace once you're amongst all your competitors. That's why you need to have that idea. It's critical for you to understand the choices your customers can make and why they should choose you. And that's the only way you'll know your competitive advantage is if you've done your research. And again, that will change even as businesses grow because landscapes grow, our economy changes and shifts to things. That's why it's really relevant to make sure that you're constantly revisiting that. You know, are we right with our target market? Are we, you know, sales are slowing down. You need to take a look at that because you might be off on market. You might be off on your demographics. Things might have shifted from that point. And that's how you stay relevant and stay in business and staying on top of that stuff. Uh, market surveys is another great way to talk to clients and get some information here as well. Um, definitely, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to do surveys. If we had more time, I actually do a, I work with you on a survey. I'm sorry, I don't have, we don't have the time tonight, but SurveyMonkey is a great tool. It's also a free, a free tool that you can use. And why you do surveys is around primary. So if you're still trying to figure out, you know, what price point should you charge? If you're still trying to figure out maybe your selection of product that you're going to offer, if it's, you know, trying to decide on what services would be most relevant and interested in customers buying them, you know, it's a great way to do that. And this is where friends and family, again, can come in and help you. Uh, sometimes I always, I discourage friends and family other than supporting you because sometimes they can muddy the water a little bit, but this is where they can help because, um, they can, you know, share these, you can do survey monkey, you can set up these great little surveys, no more between six to eight questions tops, no more than 10 questions, otherwise you've lost me with survey monkey, you can do 10 questions. And then you want to be able to make it engaging. So to, in order to get the right answers. So you want to think about questions that are what we call Oprah ended, um, you know, things that have maybe selections. So for example, if I was trying to figure out, maybe I was opening up a bakery. I love bakery. I love food, period. I'm a foodie. And if I was trying to figure out the main product lines in my bakery, I might do a survey and I would ask, you know, what type of products should I serve in my bakery? And I would list, you know, I'm sorry if you're hungry. I apologize. Cakes, pies, cookies, tarts, whatever, squares. And I would get on that survey, I would want people to, to you know, to answer their best what they prefer. And maybe I get them to rank it most favorite to least favorite. And when the survey came back, I would need to be objective. Now, I love butter tarts. I'm a tart girl. I love the sound doesn't sound right, but I love tarts is what I'm going to say. So, but if I really am look, and if when I get my survey back and tarts are the very number five, they're not even on the list or just off the list, I'm not going to fill my bakery with tarts. Because otherwise I'm not going to have a business, right? And so you have to be objective. Even though I love tarts, I might said, decide instead maybe to order or have one product line of tarts and maybe go with the most popular, which tends to be a butter tart. Okay, do you see where I'm going? But that information is critical and it's important. Questions to be careful of. Again, age. Unless you really need to know my age, don't ask me. And if you want to ask the age question, it's better formed in a, um, a range. So for example, if you maybe you are building that children-based business, that children will be coming to your place of business and you want to sort of get an idea of age range, then you would actually have the age range. So instead of asking somebody, how old are you? None of your business. You might say instead, are you within this age range? 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, et cetera. Less invasive and people are more apt to answer. Same with the income question. So, you know, unless you really need to know about disposable income, if I was a high ticket item, like if I was selling spas, hot tubs, things like that, 
there is a discretionary in, um, point where people have that extra money at the end of the month. I would be wanting to target how much money they would have because that would help inform me as to, you know, what price points they're willing to pay for my spa, hot tubs and spas and things like that. So rather than saying, how much money do you make in a year? None of your business. I might say, how much disposable income do you have at the end of the month? You know, 1,000 to 2,000, you know, under 500, 1,000, 2,000, 2,000, you get my point. Um, less invasive, but still captures that, that questions. And unless you need to know that, those two questions less that you can ask, if that makes sense. If you don't need to know them, you want to you want to get right to the points of what do you want to know? Okay, political views, things like religion, that's where you start to straddle lines that are insulting. And we certainly don't want to insult our customers because we can use these surveys as ways, as entrance points to actually as warm leads to our particular customers. So if you're starting out in business or you just launched your business, you can say, listen, I've just started this business. I'm working on building this or I'm planning on starting this business. I'd love to, you know, so I, if you can help me with these questions, that would be great. And at the end, you'd want to contact, get their contact information. And hey, I'd love to let you know when our store is officially open or my business is officially online. So you're using these as a warm lead and certainly not a place of, of making feel, people feel insulted or, or things like that. Not a great way to start the business. So there's different types, as I mentioned. That tool, SurveyMonkey, I mentioned, I don't get a commission for them. I just, I use it because it's, it's very easy to use and it's fairly, I'm not a tech savvy person. So it's a great tool and it does have different types of questions and way you can set up your questions. So very user friendly. I can vouch for that for sure. Other ways to sort of test your market is focus groups. I love focus groups. Um, and now that we're sort of returning to our world of in-person stuff, I mean, you can certainly do a focus group online. Absolutely. hundred um, percent. But, you know, it's nice to get in person. We were just talking about this earlier. It's nice to be in person with people again. And focus groups are a great way to inform on, you know, just having testing products, things like that. If anybody's ever heard of Deb's Dips, Deb's Dips was a, a powder type of dip that you mix with a sour cream or yogurt, things like that. Um, and he creates a dip for vegetables and fruit and all kinds of stuff. She has built her business on focus groups. She travels across the, across the province, I'm pretty sure, and does all kinds of events. If you ever see her, um, she'll have all these types of bits and you buy the powdered stuff and then take it home and add it to your dips later. What's interesting about the way her business model is, is that all of her next year's product line are determined by her 20% customers, remember that 80-20 rule I had? She takes her top buyers, her top customers, and invites them in to taste test product samples for the next coming year. Talk about a way of engaging and keep people interested. These people already are believers. And so bringing them back to help make major financial decisions, pretty cool and quite a nice compliment. But that's how she keeps them engaged. And that's how the, her flavors for the following years are determined. So great way to do it. And a great way to talk to people, things like that. As I said, you can do them online. I've done facilitated focus groups online. Um, you know, and you, it's just, you gotta be really engaging and keep people interested for sure. Ask proper questions and that. And I've always, when I've worked with companies, cause as, as I said, I do project work with companies. I was involved with one that they were rebranding. Um, they sold coffee. So they were rebranding their coffee brand. And so they were looking at packaging and color and things like that. We did it online because it was during the Zoom lockdown days. And what the company did afterwards is they sent out new bags of coffee with both the, the old design and the new design as a thank you to the clients that participated. And we had about 60 clients that went through that. So it was good, good things to do. So again, keeping engaged. Product trials, another great way to do your research. You know, um, having free samples of stuff. You see, we all get the stuff in the mail, the coupons, the risk-free, the, you know, makeup samples, the cream samples. These are all ways that companies are doing market research. That's what they're doing, right? Because they're handing out these samples. They're getting you to try it. They're getting you to, to select and get feedback from you, things like that. Is there an opportunity for you to do stuff like that? Is there an opportunity? If you're a product-based business, how can you bring people into your you, Hey, Edge has a great space that you could probably rent. I'm sure Marisol would happy to let you, you know, come in one night or come in during the day and, you know, rent out a space there and do some product testing. 
have some clients tested, have some, you know, people, maybe you have an actual product, people need to touch, feel, whatever. Maybe you want to talk about your services. Maybe you want to do an open house or something like that. It's another great way. Let me move to that. We'll talk to that in a second. Social media. Talk about a great way to do, how many of you have done this? How many have done uh, Instagram? As I said, I do have an Instagram account. And I do, if you ever notice sometimes when you do your Instagram, you'll follow through. I'm sorry, they'll do the stories, right? The stories at the top and they'll have questions. You know, what do you think about this? Pick this or this. And you know, you pick one of the buttons and it shows you immediately how many people picked which one, A or B. That's market research, folks. That's what that is. They really not really, as much as they care, they don't care. They're asking you for a reason, right? And social media is sometimes a great avenue to do that research when you have a business that maybe is more restrictive as far as surveys and things, for example. If I was in the healthcare businesses, sometimes as a practitioner in healthcare and things like that, I might not be able to survey my clients. Or if I do survey my clients, it's just for my own use. I can't publish the information. You know, there's there's rules and regula regulations around privacy and confidentiality and, and things like that. But if I was a practitioner, I might ask some general questions on my social media to help get some of the answers that I seek. So maybe I wanted to offer some new services. I might put a couple of questions on social media and it's, my, it's a slower way, but I'm getting the response from my, my clientele without being invasive in how I'm asking, right? So that's kind of a ways to use it. But social media is a great way to do it. You can actually create surveys on Facebook. You can create little surveys on Instagram. It's possible to do all this stuff. Um, and it's a great way to sort of, again, uh, talk to your target markets if that's the right target market that you're looking for, right? So LinkedIn, another great one. LinkedIn is a great one. All of you should be on LinkedIn. If you are businesses, you should be on LinkedIn. You should have an account on LinkedIn because business to business, that is the Facebook. LinkedIn is the Facebook for business. And it's really important. So you can embed little surveys in there. You can embed little questions in that. And you can embed that. And that's, again, a great way of talking about your target market there is right there in front of you. And people who subscribe to follow you on LinkedIn and you're following them, then again, you're getting that research that you're looking for. And it's a great way to do it. And it's free. Right, LinkedIn. You don't cost. Doesn't cost you anything to use LinkedIn. You, if you, unless you take the higher version, that's fair. But just regular everyday use, you should have one, and you should have one both business and personal, right? Because because sometimes personal doesn't always mirror business. So you should think about that. Happy to talk about that too, because I have a strong feelings about that. If you can't tell already, I might be a little speedy. I just want to make sure I get through all of this. So I apologize if it feels a little bit fast. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, we were talking about focus groups and that, but here's some other avenues to do some market research. These are all market research ways of doing business. You can open up pop-up shops. This is happening a lot now where we've got empty stores, not a good thing when we have empty storefronts on downtowns and things like that, going and asking the landlord, hey, could I rent your store for a month? Could I rent your you know, place for a week, a weekend, things like that. I just want to do a little pop-up. You know, I want to sort of experiment to see what my what the reaction is if I can get company uh, clients, I should say, not companies, clients to come and visit me. Maybe you offer an open house. I mentioned earlier, if you were a practitioner or a service based business, having uh, some kind of little open house where you maybe you have a presentation, maybe you bring in a guest speaker on a topic, you have some light refreshments or d'oeuvres, whatever. But it gives you an opportunity to bring people into a room to hear what you have to say about your services, to bring other guest speakers in to support your services. What a great way to start to build connections and rapport. Because I'm sorry, an email, as we all know, is a little bit dry. It's not friendly. You know, it's, it's hard to invoke personality into an email. It's hard to invoke personality, uh, you know, into just basic sort of... Um, what do you call it? Like just when you sort of throw out emails blankly, you know what I mean? Uh, it tar it, it's, it's just, there's nothing to that. But if you start to leverage your personality, your business, your practitioners, maybe other people that you work with, other, other clients, you know, maybe you bring in clients and have a, a night where you celebrate the success stories of these clients because they've worked with your business 
and they are successful now or they've got the right products or whatever. And again, I'm trying to be very general here. You get where I'm saying, talking about having your 20% refer you and now they're bringing their friends and, and guests and things like this to the event to celebrate with you. This is how we start to build connection and we start to build this. And we also get more information as to how we can be better. I had a client years ago who um, I would say this is probably 12 years ago. Um, and she knows I tell this story. So I use her name and everything. Her name is Jackie Prince. And she was ahead of the cupcakery curve. She was thinking about cupcakes long before cupcakeries were a thing. And what she did is, so I'm going back probably easily about 14 years ago, probably. And she came into the, to, to visit with me and as, a, as an advisor, we talked about, and what she was doing at the time, she said, you know, I'm trying to sell cupcakes. And I'm like, okay, interesting. Never thought about that. And she was using the farmer's market. And so every week she would show up with different flavors, different colored toppings, different, you know, and she would ask customers what they thought. What do you like about this flavor? What do you like about this color? What do you like about this topping? What do you don't like? Things like that. She did that for a couple of years and she built her momentum. She didn't have capacity at the time to just go in and open up a business, a store. And she wasn't sure if there was a marketplace for this at that time. So she did this consistently for two years, almost three years. And then after about the third year, she had clients seeking her outside of farmer market hours, right? Then you know you have something, right? Then she had something. She went and signed a lease. She opened up Sweet Temptations, which was a store, cupcakery store here in Guelph. And she built her marketplace. From there, then she started researching about attending fairs and how do you attend fairs and festivals and events to build her marketplace. You know, how do you do that with cupcakes? You're carrying them, they break, they fall, they whatever. It's, you know, very sanitary issues. Well, then she started doing her research about trucks, food trucks, and she added a food truck to her offering. So she actually had a, I think it's called Twinkle, was the name of this food truck, and it would go. So again, through her market research, she was able to establish. Um, she was, she actually sold this business a couple years ago. I'm going to say probably close to five years ago now. Uh, to another another entrepreneur, uh, Chilla is her name, Chilla and her business partner, and I can't let like, me think of her business partner's name, they took over and then took the store to the next level. So they're offering macaroons and product lines that were not within the cupcakery originally. So again, they've grown on based on their research and they'll play with products. They'll throw in a, hey, we're experimenting. We're going to try this product. What do you think? Let us know. People will come buy it, take it, like it, don't like it. And that then informs the decision of what they offer. Okay, so think about that. What can you do to test the market? What can you do to entice the audience? What can you do to build better rapport with the client you're trying to connect? These are all great ways to do it. They are all market research, right? See, market research isn't that boring. It's kind of fun, actually. Analysis. So once we get the data, then what do we do with it, right? We have to be open-minded, as I said. If you remember my bakery story, if tarts weren't going to be my whole bakery, I had to be okay with that, right? So you have to separate the actual, your personal feelings. I appreciate it. It's your baby. This is your business. You're very tied to it. I get it. But when it comes to what the customer wants, which is what we really want to know, then we have to separate our personal out of that. So once you analyze, you take a look at the information, then there could be some great things that come to mind, things you've not thought about it. So you sort of maybe, you know, if I'm looking at a new service and I've got a great, you know, adding a new service to my service offering and I'm getting a great response that people are really interested in this particular service, well, then I do my research and how much is it going to cost me? It's not free for me to offer this service to my business because it might cost uh, you know, people power to make this happen. It might cost new equipment. It might cost new ways of marketing. It might cost new packaging. Again, there's, there's going to be a cost. I, before I make this decision, I got to make sure that I, I work with the information to see if it is feasible for me to do it. Yes, I'd love to please all my customers, but if it's not feasible and fiscally responsible of me for, to add this product or service, then I can't do it right? You have to think about that. That's part of your business case. 
Then once I figure out, then what's the strategy? Once I, if I'm willing to move forward with this, then how are we going to launch it? How are we going to put this product into the, the marketplace? How are we going to put this service into the marketplace? What vehicles? Vehicles are another word for marketing tools. So if you're not familiar with that, what vehicles will I use? What's our customer journey map look like? Remember that customer journey map? What does that look like for the induction of this product or service into our market, right? What's the timing of it? And then we do it. And guess what? We launch it. We have a product launch. We have an open house. We have a special event. We do, you know, we put a press release in the newspaper. We do something to announce this is here. And then we step back and guess what? We've got to analyze again, right? We've got to make sure what's working, what's not working. We adapt, we pivot. My favorite words, adapt, pivot, revamp, do what you got to do, and then come back to it again, okay? This is what this is all about. But unless you do the work, unless you do the research, you certainly just don't want to say, well, yeah, sure, I can add that product line, add it in without doing the research, without looking at the cost, the implications, things like that, and then the product tanks. And then you're left with all this product, no marketplace to sell it, and you're, you're going to be out of business before you know it, okay? So that's why this is so important, and it's process, right? Because ultimately, what we want to do is be able to answer the who, the what, the where, the why, the when, the how. Those are all the marketing sales tactics that come after. But in order to be ready for it and informed and make sound, intelligent business decisions, we have to do the research to make sure we can answer those questions. That's what we're working on. Okay. I want to ask and please shout out if you know what is the common link with these businesses? Does anybody know? I'm waiting. Anything? Guess? Oh, tough crowd. Quiet. Okay, fair enough. I'll give you a hint. Target, Forever 21, Olive Garden, Bretons, all American companies, okay? Tim Hortons, believe it or not, Cafe and Bake Shop is actually American subsidiary of Tim Hortons Canada, okay? So it is considered American. All of these companies tried to come into Canada, and guess what? They didn't do their market research and miserably failed. There is still a Krispy Kreme in town. I know there's still one in Mississauga. That was, and I think there's one in downtown Toronto. That is the original, the first. It's the only one here. Okay. Same with Target. If anybody remember Target, I was so excited when Target was coming to town. I was a shopper of Target in the States. And their product and service and quality was exceptional in the state. Where they didn't do their research as they came into Canada. They had empty shelves. If you remember, if anybody remember going to the stores, there were empty sections, empty shelves. They didn't do a proper uh, research on supply, demand, suppliers, customs. You know, they could not compete. They lasted less than a year and then folded up and left, left town. Same with Olive Garden. Olive Garden was only in Canada for a couple of years and left. And then sadly, I hear that they've actually closed in the States now. Tim Hortons. You know, hard to compete. Tim Hortons, we love our Tim Hortons. Well, not all of us. A lot of us love Tim Hortons here in, in Canada. It's, you know, Timmy's, our Timmy's, things like that. Not so much in the States. In the States, they're big fans of Dunkin' Donuts. So Tim Hortons was not well received. The Cafe and Bake Shop, which is their iteration of a coffee shop in, in the States. But tough competition with Dunkin' Donuts, who owns the rights. And Starbucks, right? They love their Starbucks. Starbucks are on every corner, I'll tell you that. So, you know, and Krispy Kreme, as I said, they were exciting when they were here, started off, but then they mixed their messages. So what happened with Krispy Kreme is that they had these exclusive stores. If anybody remembers, there was lineups around the store when they first opened. I remember there was paramedics there because people were fainting from the heat. It was a July day, you know, and set them apart as a designer donut then didn't get the attraction that they were looking for and started boxing the donuts and six packs and selling them at Walmart. So when you talk about wrong target markets, they had two completely different target markets. The bulk pack at Walmart is a different target market than the, the designer donut that they were trying to go for originally. 
okay? Con didn't, it was conflicting and hence it didn't go very far. And they're actually not on the shelves at Walmart anymore, okay? So, you know, this is, this is my point. These are major companies. They were all started out like business owners like yourself. Target started with one store. So did Forever 21, so did Olive Garden. You see where I'm going with this. And, and it, even these big companies as well were guilty of not doing the research. Get yourself sorted out, do the research, put it together. If you need help, you have questions, the EDGE team is amazing. Um, they can absolutely, if you need further help, they can certainly, I, I mean, they have the expertise there. They have lots of people who can answer the question. If you're missing it, then certainly um, Marisol can reach out to me and, and we'll go from there. The last thing before I sign off here is I just want to mention this business model canvas. This is one of the other tools on the sprint point thing. As I mentioned about business plans earlier, if business plan is a bit intimidating or you're like, Christelle, I just don't have the time for this right now because I'm busy trying to get this business going. Look at a business model canvas. It's a one page document. You can download it. It's, it walks you through. So all of these components are critical components of a business plan put on one page. And so if you're starting new business, this is a great place to start and make sure that you it, it, it prompts you with questions. Again, it's hard to see right now, but it'll prompt you with the questions of the information you need to fill out. If you are an existing business or a scalable business and you're maybe launching a new product or service, this is a great tool again to use because you can it helps you answer those questions about is this a you know good idea to launch this product or service and go forward with it. Excellent tool, downloadable through Sprint Point. You know, and again, I promise you, if you anybody gets solicited, you personally find me and I will take care of it because it, uh, it won't happen. Whew, holy smoke, 724. That was a lot of information. I could have spent a lot more time on that um, and go into more detail. So thank you for honoring me tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. I really appreciate that you all hung out and, and engaged. I hope there was some good resources, some good information here. Again, the EDGE team are amazing people. I, it's my pleasure to work with them every day. Uh, and I thank you for, uh, yeah, just your time and attention tonight because I appreciate you've got lots of things I'm sure you would like to do, but I really appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks, thank ladies. You. Yeah, thank you very much. It was indeed thank amazing. So Good. Well, one small question is that sure. previously during your presentation, you said that uh, we can't, as a business, uh, uh, business can't talk bad about other businesses. Right. Why exactly again? Because you don't want that to come back and bite you, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it, it, mocking or making, uh, bringing down another business isn't good business practice. It's not, um, it's not ethical and it doesn't fare well on you either, right, as a business. So what I always say is it's important to understand that there's problems or ethics about the business but bring the customer, instead of slamming the business, it's better just to bring them back to um, why, like I wouldn't even make a comment. So for example, if somebody said ABC is a sucks, you know, customer came to me and said, ABC is a terrible company. I'm never going to work with them ever. I'm sorry to hear about that, Mr. Smith. Here's how our company can help you, right? I haven't said anything. I haven't engaged. I'm not about bringing down ABC because I don't want ABC saying anything or bad mouthing me if they heard that, found out that I was doing that. It's not good business practice. So it's better for me just to bring it back to here's how our company, sorry to hear about your experience. There's the empathy. Here's how we can help. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Makes sense. Just to redirect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. And always stay above, above board. Cause like I said, you never want it to come back and bite you. And sure as heck, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody will tell somebody <laughs> it just happens. Hi. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Nima. I don't know Hi, if Nathaniel Nima. had his hand up before me. Uh, sorry, Nathan. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for the presentation, and I really appreciated the uh, the examples, like the real life examples and the applications there, because I am a very like visual learner, so that was very helpful. So thank you so much. Well, appreciate I appreciate that, and I am too. So thank you for saying that. I, I, yeah, I, no problem. Storytelling is a great way to learn things. And that's why I think it's, it makes it a little bit more relatable sometimes when, even if you're thinking about it a couple months from now, you're like, oh yeah, she was talking about the bakery. Yeah, I remember that, right? So thanks for that, I appreciate it. Nathaniel, did you have something you wanted to say? 
Yes, I had a question for you. Um, you touched on briefly um, surveys. How would you recommend getting that survey out there into the world? With service-based business? With surveys. Oh, surveys. Like market research surveys. Yeah, so I mentioned about the tool of SurveyMonkey. Mm -hmm. uh, SurveyMonkey is a great tool. So you would send, and what I would say to you is if, if you can create a survey, now we're getting back into physical again and physical real world. So, you know, if, if you wanted to do, uh, you know, go out and talk to people and, and remember, that, I don't know if you remember that, I might be dating myself, but I remember I used to go to the grocery store and there'd be people standing outside. Not so much anymore because people don't really stop. So what I would say is, is, you know, creating a survey and then getting your friends and family and colleagues to pass that survey out, whether you email it to them and then they email it out from there. Um, you know, it's a great way to sort of, I, I've done many surveys that way. And I find that, you know, if you just ask people, hey, could you, you know, maybe it's your social group, maybe it's your colleagues, maybe it's your family, partners, colleagues, whoever, and just say, you know, I, I really appreciate your help. I really need some information, advice on that. Most people are willing to help. Uh, perhaps if you have children and sporting activities, you know, sometimes you'll have parents sitting around watching sporting activities, you know, to ask them for a few minutes, can I just get two minutes of your time just to fill out a quick survey while you're here? Oh. Yeah, most people are happy to help. Um, another thing that you touched on was steering away from those more demographic focused questions like age, race, um, stuff like that. Unless you absolutely need to know them. Yeah. How how would you recommend, if you're doing it online, how would you recommend filtering your responses then? Um, well, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, because I, the responses would come from the question, right? So, okay. yeah, so, because with SurveyMonkey, if you take a look at it, you can set up the questions. So unless an age question is really something I need to know, an age demographic, I wouldn't even ask the question. Okay. Thank that's you. that's the easiest way to do it i think you know what i mean unless and like i said and, and if you do you want to have a purpose because as i said if you're at, uh, if you're a good survey is only six to eight questions maybe 10 tops after yeah. that you've lost me because you're you're i'm bored you're bored i'm bored i'm not going to do it. it's too much of my time right so yeah. i would rather use those 10 questions on stuff that is really really relevant, like my product line offering or my service offering, or, um, you know, how often would you use my service or product, you know, every month, every two months, every four months, do you see what I mean? And again, I have to speak very generically, yeah. but yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, who else is here, here? I see I, my screen is very blurry, so I can't see. Page favor page there and favor, favor Artem and Page. Okay, excellent. Whoever wants to go first, um, I can. <laughs> oh wait, wait. I just want to follow up on, on Nathaniel and ask how many questions. Oh, else else oh sorry, we've got Before. a bunch of people. Oh. Hang on. Um, okay. Is he Paige, are you going? Yep. 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 Uh, okay, I was just gonna say somebody asked about filtering the responses. I don't know if this was said, but if you use forms to do an online thing, you can make it so that when they answer, it'll branch off if they don't apply type of thing. If you wanted to filter, if you really wanted to filter the responses. Thank you for saying that, Paige. That was, yeah, we need to hear. I appreciate that. Thank you. Very helpful. Sorry, Favor, we'll come back to you. Do you want to go? Did you? I didn't hear your question or your comment. Oh yeah, for sure. I was just going yeah. to follow up on uh, Nathaniel. How many questions would be good for? Yeah. Target? No more than ten. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 And that's why you got to be really targeted, right? Because again, think about it yourself. If somebody came to you with a three-page survey, can you do this for me? Uh, no. <laughs> right. Like we're all busy, right? So, but you know, really crisp clear questions you should be able to get in 10 and no thanks for asking two favor because i would say no yes or no questions they don't help you and they waste questions so what i mean by that is so for example if i was trying to sell ice cream do you eat ice cream yes or no well yes now what right but if i was asking what types of ice cream you know and then i listed types of ways soft serve versus scoop versus do you see what I mean and I, I sort of listed all the ways you could eat ice cream that's going to give me more qualitative quantitative information 
rather than just a yes or no question, right? And it's using one question, but I've got multiple results that I can get from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, great, thank you. Artem. Yeah, so I had a question uh, about the data that you, uh, the data and statistic that we can use in order to create our businesses. Yes. So I see that we have uh, a lot of resources. And my question is to you, is that during the, uh, during this, when you use these resources, mm -hmm. what did you feel lacked? Because as I am a software developer with data science, uh, with interest in data science, and I yes. can create something that can, um, uh, I work with data and I mm -hmm. can make sure that this data is approachable to people. So that's why I wanted to ask you, uh, so the data that you used uh, does, what is lacked for B2B uh, applications? Maybe mm. some uh, companies want some specific way to organize this data. Maybe they will even pay for an, data analysis on their part. Uh, what yeah, do you think about point. it uh, in general? What do you think about what, how it could be, how this experience could be improved? Yeah, that's a good question. B two B is interesting too because it's it's definitely harder to sell B two B because you you know when you're doing your research, you're for example if you're trying to figure out if it's your target market or if it's a company that you want to do business with, you sort of have to read between the lines. So you can check out their website, you can check out their social media, but there's not a lot of data sometimes on on what's within the context of the business, right? Like you might not know revenues, you might not, you won't know revenues, you won't know, um, you know, how many employees you won't know, you know, things like that. And, and you're not wrong. That's sometimes that's private information that they're willing to share or not willing to share. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, I don't know, it's a hard question because it just for me, if I was that consult, which I do, I work with, I try to do work with companies. And I, what I do for that is when I do my own data sourcing, I'll look at the website, I'll look at, you know, if they are membership member, have memberships, like they advertise to networking and, and groups. So for example, chambers of commerce or things like that, then I will look to the chambers of commerce because chambers of commerce will have business directories, right, of their members, which then have more information, right? So if I click on that business on a chamber of commerce directory, for example, or uh, I, I think it's, I'm trying to remember what they're called. Is it business trade, business and trade, or I can't think of, there's different variations of business support agencies and business organizations, but they will have different contexts of information available to me that will probably tell me a little bit more. So I, I would say to you, I, it's not a really great answer, but I would say to you, it, it requires more digging. And I'm not sure that you could make it easier because I'm not sure companies would always be willing to share the data. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. It's more, I would say it's more 